Welcome everyone to Salado United Methodist Church. Today is Christ the King Sunday or the Reign of Christ Sunday and we will be worshiping using the Gospel of Matthew. I want to especially welcome those who are visiting us uh, through YouTube from around the United States, around Texas, and uh, around the village of Salado. Uh, tonight, the village will have its community ecumenical Thanksgiving service at the Church of Christ, and we will do it by video. Uh, it starts at 6 o'clock, and uh, they have asked me to preach it and I told them that I would. So I would invite you, if you would, to uh, get ready and stand for our hymn this morning, which is Trust and Obey, verses one through four. May we stand. talk about our stewardship campaign and our budget for next year, I'm excited to introduce part of our confirmation class of 2020 to help me to talk about just where our budget goes. Friends, what do you have to say about our budget? Through our budget, we provide medical care for the sick by supporting programs such as the Body of Christ Clinic. Through our budget, we heat and cool the church building, maintain the grounds, and keep the church in good repair for our comfort and use. Through our budget, we reach out to our community, our country, and the world preaching, teaching, and healing in Christ's name. The budget is our church at work. It allows your prayers and your concerns to be converted into action. 
Through our budget, we as a church launch families in marriage, watch families grow as we baptize children and train young persons in Christian character. Through our budget, we provide church schools and activities for children and adults. Through our budget, we fulfill Christ's commandment to feed his sheep when we care for homeless families in the Family Progress Program, support Methodist children's homes, and educate the orphans in Africa. Through our budget, we provide music and preaching to enrich worship. We need your support to help us accomplish all these important missions and many more. Please complete your pledge and return it to the church staff. Thank you for joining us for worship today. If you would, please bow your heads as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Sovereign God, we confess that we have given idols power over us, the idols of power and wealth, fame and security. We confess that we've fallen into the ways of this world and have forgotten our kindred in Christ, and we have lost sight of the reign of God here on earth. And instead, we've allowed the idols of the world to rule over us. Forgive us. Call us into your reign to declare you the one who has power over us, because your power is love. Call us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to work for justice, show mercy, and love one another in the name of Christ. Jesus came to us not to reign as a king over us, but to serve us and to show us the way of God is the way of love. Jesus said the first would be last and the last would be first. And Jesus calls us to become humble and serve one another. And that the most important commandment was to love God and love our neighbor as ourselves. This is the way of our sovereign. May we go forward this morning knowing that we are forgiven and that we will love and serve one another, especially our neighbors in need. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our next hymn this morning is number 462, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. We're going to sing verses 1 through 4, so please stand and sing with me. Jesus. 
Jesus, all for grace to trust Him more. Today our Sunday worship focuses on Christ the King Sunday, or uh, sometimes it's called the Reign of Christ Sunday for those who are against the British monarchy. So the, the point of Christ the King Sunday is it is the crescendo of the Christian year. It is the last Sunday of the Christian year. And next Sunday, we will start the first Sunday of the next year, which will be the first Sunday of Advent. But today it is the last Sunday after Pentecost, and it's also uh, called this uh, Reign of Christ Sunday. Our lesson for uh, this intersection between the two years is uh, Matthew 25, and uh, we are going to begin at the 31st verse. So I would ask you, if you would, to hear the gospel lesson for the day. When the Son of Man comes in glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All nations will be gathered there before him, and he will separate people one from the other, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you as a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, uh, you that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did nothing to give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, St. Augustine, who was as brilliant a human being as, as ever walked the face of the earth, one time said, or wrote anyway, that when Christians borrow from pagans for purposes of the divine or for godly purposes, then they do something similar to what the Israelites did when they plundered the Egyptians, which is kind of a humorous story that's in Exodus uh, 3. Uh, the gist of it is that the women uh, that are uh, Hebrews take the best gold and jewelry and uh, so forth as they flee from the Egyptians. They basically rob them blind. And uh, I'd like to borrow from Stephen Covey, 
who uh, is kind of, uh, uh, he's, he's the late Stephen Covey. He was sort of a practical philosopher, and he had a lot of very good ideas. He wrote several very helpful books that many people swear by. And one of the things that he wrote was The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And uh, he had seven steps, or seven habits, as he calls them, that successful people have. And habit number two said this, begin with the end in mind. Begin with the end in mind. And what Covey meant by this, I believe, is for someone who is uh, beginning a pursuit to know exactly where your objective is, where your aim is, where your purpose is, what your goal is, because if we just wander around hoping that we will find something good and interesting, it is um, probably true that we will not find it. And if we know what we're looking for, if we aim in the right direction, if we begin with the end in mind, then we can be effective people. What Covey calls uh, the end in mind is what the Bible typically calls judgment. Judgment is sort of the end game that God and God's covenant people play with one another. And uh, in fact, the whole chapter 25 in uh, Matthew's gospel has to do with judgment or the end times or sometimes big fancy theological word eschaton. And eschatology is the doctrine of the last things. Whatever you want to call it, uh, it is when God and people and the earth have a reckoning, a divine reckoning. And so in the very first parable in uh, chapter 25, we have this story of the ten uh, wise and foolish maidens. And the, the point of that particular parable that Jesus tells is, be prepared. Know what it is that you need to do to be ready for the coming of the Messiah, who in the parable is called the bridegroom. But the idea is uh, when Jesus comes back, not only should you be prepared, but you should look busy, as uh, one of my friends likes to put it. Um, the second parable in chapter 25 of Matthew's gospel is the parable of the talents. And the parable of the talents essentially says, use the gifts that God has given you in order to be ready for the coming of the Messiah. While the Messiah is gone, be sure that you uh, take risks, that you are creative, and that you help build up the kingdom of God in the absence of the Messiah who will return as promised. We just don't know when. So these are two elements of what it means to begin with the end in mind. Our parable for today is one that I like to call, you never know. The uh, sheep who are the righteous, and the goats who tend to be lumped into the unrighteous group, both have the same opportunities. And Jesus goes through this long ordeal. There's a lot of repetition in this particular parable. But essentially, if you boil it down to the, that black part at the bottom of the cup, what you get is simply this. How you treat others, small, weak, sick, prisoners, those that are naked, those that are homeless, those that are thirsty, those that are hungry. How one treats these people is how Jesus will end up treating you later. And uh, both groups, both the righteous and the unrighteous, basically ask the same question. When did we see you in this situation, Jesus? And uh, Jesus says the same thing to both groups. Uh, as you did this to the least of these, you did it to me. 
And uh, that is the basis of the separation. Some go to the left, some go to the right. But uh, the truth is that uh, it's on the basis of their actions towards others which they do not recognize as being Jesus, that Jesus either blesses them or I don't know that you would say that Jesus curses them, but at least he does not give them the uh, five-star, two-thumbs-up treatment. He basically puts them on the left, which in uh, the ancient world was the bad side of things. That's why everybody wants to be... Uh, right-handed. Uh, you probably remember the days when one parent or another on your child's baseball team or maybe you uh, saw this as a child on a baseball team where the parents would try to make the children bat right-handed, throw right-handed because to be left is a bad thing. In fact, the word gauche, which we use from time to time is a French word, which, which means just odd or outside the norm or something like that. Uh, what's interesting about this parable of the last judgment is it does not seem like Jesus really cares much about a confession of faith. He doesn't ask people what they believe, what they swear to. Uh, he never asks either group what they think about him. He just, he just doesn't. He measures their worth strictly on what they do to these certain people. They're not uh, uh, mechanically making a confession of faith to get to the end, which is a good end. Instead, what, what Jesus uh, judges them on is simply what they do to the last, the lost, and the least. And uh, the reason that Jesus is the judge here in the last judgment, uh, which is sometimes what this parable is called, is because Jesus sees as God sees. And so on this last uh, Sunday of the year, what, uh, what I want us to understand is this perspective of uh, looking at life with the uh, end in mind before we start our pursuits is to look at life in a long haul, a long perspective. And instead of just being a Christian for uh, three days and then putting it on the shelf for the next 70 years, that uh, what we try to do as disciples of Jesus and as Jesus points out to us in this parable is we become decent people who not only profess faith, but we do faith. We act out our faith, and if we can do that, then we truly are disciples uh, of Jesus. And so I would ask you to pray with me. Grace is God, even though we do not want to be goats, and many of us don't even want to be sheep, we ask you to help us understand these metaphors as metaphors of life and life lived well or less than well. And so we ask you to keep us in your keeping, God, guard, and watch over us. And we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please stand for our affirmation of faith, number 883. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Our praise song this morning is titled Graves into Garden. So if you'll stand and sing with me. Singing this out, I search the world. And I search the world. But it couldn't fill me. A man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid and I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend as the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you Lord there's nothing better than you Lord there's Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Here comes that bridge. Now you turn mourning into dancing. You turn mourning into dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who That again, you turn mourning into dancing. You turn mourning into dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn grace. You turn grace into God. Out. You 
turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into army. You turn seas into highways. You're the only I would like to offer the benediction now. May we hear this in the spirit in which it's spoken. May God's spirit of goodness, of grace, of mercy, and of forgiveness be yours not only for this past year, but lead you into a new and blessed year in the Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We would just like to thank you so much for joining with us online, um, whether you're at home or uh, on your phone somewhere else. We just uh, we're so grateful to, to have you with us. And um, we ask that um, if you're a visitor with us and um, you're interested in, in learning more about the church that you call the church office or you um, respond to one of the emails that you can find um, online. So as we send forth, we uh, pray that you have a great week and let's sing that chorus one more time. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing Nothing is better than you. Let's sing that one more, one more time. Oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing. Nothing is better. Happy Sunday. I am here today with the children's sermon, and today we're going to be reading from Matthew 25, verses 35, 37, and 40. It says, When I was hungry, you gave me food. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the least of one of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Have you ever been hungry? I don't mean just a little bit hungry. I mean really hungry. With no hope of anything to eat today, tomorrow, or the next day. Sometimes we forget that not everyone in the world has plenty of food to eat. I want you to, after this, take one minute and think about all of your favorite types of food and all of the different types of food that you can answer or think about in one minute. Then I want you to think about the fact that in that one minute, while you were thinking about all the things that you like to eat and all the food that you can imagine, that Possibly up to 12 children in the world died because of a hunger-related illness. One day, Jesus was speaking to a group of people, and he said to them, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. When did we do that? they asked. And Jesus answered them, 
if you did it for one of the least of my children, you did it for me. We have a lot to be thankful for, don't we? The question is, are we willing to share it with some of those who are less fortunate? Will you share what you have with those who are in need? Remember, sharing with those who are in need is the same as doing it for Jesus. Let's end this with a prayer. Heavenly Father, you have given us so much. May we be willing to share it with those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys. As we leave out of watching this video, take some time to think about how you and your family can do real tangible things to help people that are in need. Maybe you donate food or money to a food pantry. Maybe you donate it to the church because we help people. Maybe you um, find some other way to help. So take a moment, think about it, and figure out how you can help people. Because when you help those that are in need, you are also helping Jesus. Bye, guys. So, Sheep... Great job out there. I mean, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty. You gave me something to drink. You invited me into your house. I needed clothes and you gave them to me. I was sick and you took care of me. You even came to visit me in prison. Seriously, great job out there, guys. What? We didn't even see you out there, Jesus. We were just trying to help people. Well, maybe so. But when you help the least of those around you, you're helping me, which is awesome. So you should come over to my place like, and stay there forever. Yes, sweet. Now about you goats, you didn't do any of that stuff. So yeah. Wait, 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 wait. If we had known you were out there, we would have done the stuff, like for you. Well, see, that's the thing. If you don't help those less than you, you're not helping me. So, uh, yeah, I think we shouldn't hang out anymore. See ya. <laughs>
But whatever you can donate, donate and do it consistently with the pledge. So we would ask you to, to do that. And thanks again so much for watching and we will see you guys soon.